occupation. How not to, how not to treat people, how not to, uh, it's a negative learning process in many regards. So, so the atmosphere that, uh, <laughs> Smith, as I've mentioned before, he went into the bank, you know, I told him to close the bank. Yeah. Smith attached the post to the division. And when he came in, it said, Headquarters, Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and the 11th Airborne Division. So he turned Where's it that? around, and he said, Headquarters, the 11th Airborne Division at Fort Campbell, and he attached the post to the division, which gave you some notion then that the division was not going to fly off and go do some contingency operation as we'd have it today. Follow me? Right, I see what you mean. But it also put the mission before the support. You put the put the division before the support, but but it didn't give you the notion that it was a uh, that we were a tenant, tenant, right? And therefore we could go fly away and do everything. The fact is, no, we were so embroiled in in post life that post life took took priority over divisional work, in my view. Yes, yes see. I'm looking at I'm looking down there as a lieutenant. You know, and so I don't, I don't see the big picture as others might see it, but uh, it, it, it had all the trappings, and I don't know, I don't know anything about the money and how much money we had to spend in those days. But it had all the trappings of uh, like a frontier uh, post garrison duty, as opposed to mission duty, which we'd all come to learn more about as we grew up. One final question I wanted to ask you about in about that era. Um, it sounds to me like drinking and gambling were not your favorite things to do, but they were a very important part of the social expectations of airborne officers in division artillery. Well, drinking was very much a s social expectation. The prop blast was a centerpiece of the activity, and I can recall, I can recall getting stone cold drunk at the prop blast when I was prop blast. Does that happen once? Is that sort of an initiation? Yeah, thing? and I can recall, I can recall later when we're getting ready to go to, to Germany, we have a new division artillery commander, Brigadier General, uh, a fellow by the name of Richard Harrison, who still lives, and a, we had a new. Uh, Devardi executive officer, James Taylor, Colonel James Taylor, and uh, I recall taking Taylor home drunk, because that was the social uh, obligation. And I can recall his wife, Art Lombardi, and I uh, took him home. He was Art was captain. I was I recall taking him home, and his wife just became outrageous, furious at us bringing her husband home oh, drunk. And that was the social expectation, was everybody had to get smashed at the prop uh, So there's a lot of, there was a lot of drinking. Gambling was a preoccupation with a group of field grade and company grade officers who had come in from the uh, Korean experience, the World War II experience. And uh, I didn't have anything to do with it, so I mean, I, I never got any tick marks on my official report that said I was anti-social or anything, but that just wasn't my bag. I wasn't doing that. And most, I'd say many of the officers shunned that. But I mean, there were a lot. There were a lot that were down here. I mean, this guy, uh, who I remarked about before, who was buying up checks. I mean, he was smart enough to know how to make money. He gambled, but he didn't gamble uh, as much as he was smart about how to pick up loose money. Because two twenty-two, twenty-two in those days, plus a hundred dollars jump pay, wasn't a lot. And he knew that a lieutenant or a bright captain who was picking up full of Colonel's chits uh, would trade two for one on uh, the check, and yet he could cash a check later and make a hell of a lot of money. Uh, so, but it, that, that just just went on. 
you know, and that was part of the airborne, hard drinking, hard fighting, carousing. We, then we'd go out and kill people on the, we killed so many people in the division that Highway 41A ran between Clarksville, Tennessee, and Hopkinsville, Kentucky. And Highway 41A was a dual lane highway with a grass median in between. And the west lying southbound lane lay on the post, and the eastbound, northbound lane lay off the post. The median went down the boundary. or the boundary went down the median. And on one of these days, payday, Smith, in an attempt to squeeze the uh, unlicensed vehicle game at that time, because you couldn't couldn't drive your vehicle on the post if you didn't have a post license. But you could get a license at that time, a state license at that time, without insurance. But you couldn't get a post tag without insurance. So a lot of cars parked in parking lots off post. So he contrived with the uh, Tennessee and Kentucky police to shut down the northbound lane so that you had both southbound and northbound traffic on the southbound on post. leg on post and he arrested and impounded hundreds of cars from the troopers because it was illegal for them to drive without a having post a post tag. tag okay and so they didn't know that the media they did they didn't i mean they figured it out as soon as they got arrested but they didn't understand that the southbound lane was on post. So you had both south and northbound traffic going on that southbound lane for this particular shutdown period. And he arrested hundreds of people and threw hundreds of cars into the post dog pound there because they didn't have post tags on it, because people didn't have insurance on it. But we were killing people head on collisions and killed five people one day and five nurses, a big, big, gigantic. problem in the local press was head-on collision between some air, drunk airborne soldier and, and five nurses on the road to Nashville. So it was a hard-drinking outfit. You're right. It had a social moray of uh, intoxication. But a moderate drinker could survive without being yeah. ostracized. Yeah. Were you starting to get good punches on your tickets? that early. There used to be sort of a you know, ethic that second lieutenant should have modest evaluation. Oh, I think I got reasonable at this church. Yeah. I would later make the only blow the zone promotion I got was from uh, Captain the Major. So I mean I must have had reasonable tickets as a lieutenant. In spite of that one you got in Vietnam from that yeah, from the dud. That one must have been considered when you were for the for your promotion. Oh yeah, major. it was horrible. Well, that sort of tidies up the uh, loose ends that I wanted to ask about. Um, you mentioned uh, in addition to West Point being a kind of a turning point, the uh, you're grabbing an assignment in the Air Defense School as another one, as sort of building your confidence and ability to present to the public, and then that was further ratified by this guy from Raytheon offering you, or RCA offering RCA, you a job. Yeah. Um, Did two things for me at, at Fort Bliss. One, instructor duty, which gave me the confidence. You give me any material you got and in uh, short order, I can get up for the public and make a sale for you. And the second is it broadened my understanding of matters military by getting me immersed in a different subject matter in the military, which was air defense. And I didn't know anything about air defense, so I learned something about air defense. And, and this was a new missile system because it had, and it had radars and rockets and 
uh, army mechanisms and all that kind of stuff, which I really was familiar with. Army in, in a cannon artillery unit or even an honest gun unit, rocketry was rather simple, warhead was rather simple, weren't in much of the radar game and some kind of battery radar. And uh, so I learned a lot. Stood in good stead from a technical standpoint. Did you know that it was a very dangerous thing not to have a battery command on your ticket? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> in those days, one, my brother, at the time that I went to Germany, my brother was a captain. He was a captain for seven years. He was a lieutenant a lot shorter time than you were, though, wasn't he? Yeah. Now, I became a lieutenant for five years. So that stretch out after the uh, Korean War sort of got you lost in the uh, perspectives of uh, whether or not you would uh, run out of time. You follow me? In other words, if you know that you're going to be up for a board, I mean, every officer in the U.S. Army today, and in the, since 1980 probably, could tell you, I got this amount of time or that amount of time. I got to get three things to get crammed into it. You follow me? Right. Okay, when I came along, five years as a lieutenant, I was looking around at people getting promoted to captain, seven more years to get to promoted to captain, plenty of time to do a lot of things. So in 1959, September of 59, I'm now six years, I get promoted to captain. Right. So my time horizon, looking down range to get promoted to major, oh, yeah, is another seven years. Another so seven you, years, you got plenty of time for a A lot of time, okay. Yeah. So Actually, you had three years and three months or something. Yeah, so now I finish the advanced course and I'm a captain. I go down and reject the, uh, the business of going to uh, the uh, Grandy. Honest John game at Aura Grandy. I got plenty of time. So going into the Hawk game was perfectly okay because I knew I'd be in a teaching time. And I, then I figured I'd probably yeah, four be more given years a, to get a command. Well, well, I had a lot of time. I'd probably pick up a Hawk battery, battery yeah. and go into a Hoss, what was called a Hawk overseas package and uh, get put into one of the uh, Hawk units. And that was my intention. Then I ran into the drunk and I said, Take, send me anywhere in the world. So when this guy came up and said, we'll send you on a short tour. I mean, he could have said, I'm sending you to Korea. He said, I'm gonna send you on a short tour because we need somebody in Vietnam. Uh, then I looked at that as only one more year. So I would have been back from uh, my overseas tour in 63 with only three and a half years service as a captain. Plenty of time to get a battery. Plenty of time. Now what happened then is the board picked me up for an accelerated promotion to major. Irrespective of no battery Ir commander. Irrespective of no battery. Sure what they didn't give a damn about being a battery commander. Yeah. Boards did. So, uh, so then you look around and you say, geez, I'm at, a, I'm, at, I'm at West Point. I mean, I, somebody says, you're going to West Point and then you're on the promotion list. So I mean, I'm out of time. There's no time to get a battery. Right. I, I see how you were, th you know. So then it's a matter of saying, well, geez, I go to West Point and I'll spend my time up there and then I'll go down to a division or whatever and I'll get to be an S3 or a battalion exec and I'll be back in mainstream. And I go to Leavenworth. 
meanwhile, the time for promotion is getting compressed because we're now in the middle of the Vietnam Expansion. War. Yeah. And so then I look around and I say, geez, you know, I'm, I'm out of that. And this guy wants to make me the deputy senior advisor of the regional forces, popular forces, and I have to stiff that. I need to get back to troops, but I want to go to troops in combat. I know if I don't go to troops in combat, I'm really hurt. Well, I didn't know how long the war was going to last. I mean, I could have gone and got been a battery, a battalion commander in Conus or Germany or someplace like that, and still gone to Vietnam. Vietnam as a battalion commander or whatever. But I wanted to go to Vietnam right out of Leavenworth because I had been away from troops since 1959. So now I am, and this is 67, so I'm eight years away from troops. I know I've got to go back to the troops. I want to go to troops. If i got to go to troops, go to troops in combat. Right. So then this turkey says, uh, You can't do it. You can't do that. You've got to go be a senior advisor, a deputy senior advisor, regional forces, five forces. Have it your way. Just I'm give me a plane ticket. <laughs> not going to do that. I'm going to do something else. So, uh, to go back to your point, did I realize being a battery commander was a uh, big problem? I said, yeah, but I mean, it, it was one of those things where uh, there's always plenty of time for right. When you came out on the accelerated list, was that a big surprise? By then, Not you, to me. You knew you were doing well? Yeah, I mean, only when you don't come out on the list is a big surprise. I mean, everybody thinks they're doing better than they are. I see. Okay. So when the list came out and I was on it, I said, you know, that's what I expected. When yeah. I didn't come out on the list to lieutenant, from lieutenant colonel to colonel, that was a big surprise. How about from major to lieutenant colonel? Is that a time was so short that I that I I wasn't I was never in the secondary zone there. I see. I was always a primary. You know, they kept squeezing the zone. Right. So. I never was in the there was time, you know. I'm able to use that later on and, and remind people that I never was a secondary zone promotee to colonel, you know, and I was a lackluster lout. So, uh, but if you'd had a decent battery commander, you might have been something. If I'd been, if been a decent, or had a, if I had been a battery commander, I might have been all right. Well, the, uh, I kind of interrupted you while you were talking about um, being chief of student activities on the staff of the Commandant of Cadets. Great activities, yeah. Yeah, and uh, you, you said that they gave you opportunities to do things, and that sort of expanded your horizons. Your, can you think of any of the things that happened that you did? or? Yeah, let me give an example about that. Uh, no, General like, General Michael Davison said to me when I took the job, when he ordered me to end the job, not when I took it, he said, uh, your job is to provide activity for the cadets and keep them gainfully occupied from 3.30 on Saturday, on Friday afternoon until 6.30 on Sunday night, as long as it's not immoral or illegal. Now he had, uh, we had, a blue book that had in it 50 plus cadet activities. Everything from cadet chapel choir to the glee club to the uh, fencing team. Whole gamut of activities parachute activities, uh, debating activities, uh, whole variety of activities. You have to supervise this whole bunch, 50-something? Yeah. So, so you see from, and, and at that time, the cadet, the, the cadet's ability to depart the military academy was slim indeed, unless he was a member of one of these cadet activities. So on the one hand, you became an escape mechanism for the cadet. And on the other hand, 
you, they had legitimate interests to pursue, and you were trying to assist them in pursuing those interests. And as anybody that is around young people, who uh, several thousand of them uh, have an enormous talent pool in that uh, uh, group of uh, young men at those days, an expanding core it was growing at those days because we were expanding up to the 4,000 group. So you look at the the core athletic squads, and then you look at the cadet activities groups, and between the two of them were the people that wanted to excel either in a team sport or an individual activity that uh, had to get either on a uh, core squad or get into one of my activities in order to, in some way, fulfill their uh, desired goals to express themselves in some manner other than academic affairs. Were the football team, the soccer team and all that under you too? No, football team's under core, core support. Soccer team is under core squad. Uh, so there were basketball, football, baseball, track, soccer, tennis. Those things were core squad. Intercollegiate core meaning Inter CORPS. Intercollegiate. CORPS core squad. Okay. Those are the intercollegiate activities. Better said, it's intercollegiate activities. Is, is there another officer who had, I mean, you mentioned yeah, the there's colonel. Some, yeah. The director of athletics? Yeah. The director of athletics runs all that stuff. Okay. I mean, he was a full colonel at that time. Uh, Ray Murphy. Okay. And he was he was one of the staff officers under the commandant like you were? Or was he? No, he was under the superintendent. He reported to the superintendent. And he was a full colonel. And of course, he had big fiduciary responsibilities because he was handling all the money from uh, Gates. The, uh, Gate receipts and all that kind of ticket management and all that kind of stuff. I was on the staff of the United States Corps of Cadets. If you look at the uh, at West Point, it's structured as, as the superintendent of the United States Military Academy. And underneath that are two, underneath that are three agencies, really, four agencies, really the post, the director of athletics the dean who handles all of academic the academic affairs and the commandant of cadet who handles all of the cadet affairs. Wow, so... And I'm on the, I'm on the staff of the uh, commandant, commandant of cadets. cadets who was Michael Davis. And the servant at this time is uh, uh, James Lampert, L-A-M-P-E-R-T, who was a Corps of Engineers. Michael Davison had been a combat command commander in World War II later would be the use for that. Lambert was Lieutenant General, Michael Davison was a career. Uh, so Davison says you got you have license to do things for the Corps according to the rules and regulations about which we administer around here. And the uh, S1 of the, the personnel officer of the Corps of Cadets at that time was uh, then Major uh, Bill Richardson, who would later be a four-star general. Uh, and we had a very distinguished <coughs> staff of uh, guys who were running the uh, U.S. Corps of Cadets. But mine was this peculiar job. And so underneath my activities, I had the debate council, I had the... Uh, a dramatic club. You know, dramatic the club. Dance, dance committee. The, Dance committee and run the hops committee, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then I had a bunch of sporting activity. I had the sailing team underneath me. I had the fencing team underneath me. I had the skydiving team underneath me. Uh, I had the rugby team underneath me. Uh, and then I was responsible for all those guys doing their things. And I had an officer who would be responsible for that, but I had jurisdiction and money a la the uh, director of athletics had uh, money, and he has uh, he had coaches reporting to me, and I had coaches reporting to me. But the coaches were officers who were doing this on a part-time basis. So, for example, yeah, they were the coach of the uh, rugby team was the uh, British liaison officer who was there. Uh, 
wonderful. And uh, his name was uh, happened to be Major Peter Thiel. He'd later become a uh, colonel commanding the Parachute Regiment at Aldershot in uh, Great Britain. But uh, Peter was the rugby team. And I'll give you, I'll give you two vignettes. So that, well, I'll give you three vignettes and <coughs> sort of explain what I would call the the entrepreneurial opportunity that I was given at the military camp. I didn't understand it really like that. I look back on it and understand it better than I did. But uh, Davidson said, you know, go run that stuff. So I ran it. And uh, in the case of the soccer team, Peter Thiel came to me and said the national soccer, or in rugby, championships would be held at South Bend, Indiana, and we'd like, he'd like to participate, because our team was clearly capable of winning the, uh, the tournament kind of thing at yeah. South Bend. Yeah, big time stuff at South Bend. I said, okay. He said, now, uh, so I said, it's going to cost a lot of money. You're out there. He said, well, he said, I've called the uh, Golden Knights, and they've agreed to lend us their aircraft. The so skydiving that's team. the skydiving team of the U.S. Army from Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and I said, terrific. So I got all that arranged, he arranged and I arranged it, and I said, well, I better give you an insurance policy, and he said, yeah, everything will be all right. I said, no, no, I'll give you an insurance policy. I said, well, because I had to have the cadets back here at 6.30 on Sunday night. I said, uh, I'll give you a check, signed check, uh, blank check. And if you have to put these guys on airplanes or anything by, you know, to get them back out of there, why well, you can sign the check. The check will be Go good. Money, yeah. The tickets. I said, I'll also give you leave blanks. In case the kids can't get back. No, no. I, because if you put them on leave, they can come at half fare. And I can save money doing that. <laughs> so I said, but you got to keep me advised of how you're doing in the tournament. And... Uh, so he called me up on uh, Saturday noon and said, well, we won our first two rugby matches. And so we're moving on up the ladder and we'll, if everything goes right, we'll play two more this afternoon. And if, we're in, if, if that happens, we'll be in the semifinals. So I got a call on Saturday night and he said, we're in the semifinals because we won two more today. We're in four matches today or whatever the hell it was. So uh, Sunday morning, so what time is the Sunday match? He said, well, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. I said, boy, that's really going to get us cramped trying to get back in there at 6.30 on uh, Sunday night. He said, yeah, but he said, we're, we're, we're running hard. We could, we could maybe win the national championships here. So he called me at noon when you get done. So he called me at noon. So said, well, we won. We're in, the, we're in the finals. So I said, what time is the finals? He said, 3 o'clock. I said, holy <laughs> mackerel. I said, I really in deep trouble here. So. I'm a major now. He's a major, I'm a major. Yeah. Supposed to be back at 6.30. Well, I know I can go to the superintendent because he told me don't do anything illegal or whatever, you know, obey the rules. But he was he, he would have applauded the fact that we were going to be in the national the championship. Finals, right? The finals. And if we won, I mean, we'd really be very pleased about that. So I said, okay, don't default, you go ahead. So you took the responsibility of all these guys being back late. You, you bet. And I didn't check with anybody. I didn't call a dean, and I didn't tell him jack shit, you know, because the easy thing. I learned, I learned early in life in that job, don't ever ask questions. That somebody might say no to it. Or they can say no to it. This pays off even when I'm the sink in Panama. So, uh, he says, oh, by the way, there are tornado warnings here. And I said, well, that means that the Golden Knights airplane won't fly because it does not have a radar on board. They won't fly that aircraft coming back. So I said, you will have to uh, use the leave blanks I told you and uh, go to Chicago, get on the airplanes. And you call me from Chicago, and I will round up the cadets 
from the several airports, which uh, they'll put them on any airplane and get them on it, the LaGuardia, JFK, or Newark, and I'll police them up. So I said, I'll run an op center in my office all night and we'll get them back. So he called me up at about uh, 5 o'clock in the afternoon and uh, said uh, we didn't win. We lost in the last two minutes, 19 to 17 or whatever a rugby scorer is. And I said, okay, what's going on? He said, well, I got three guys with broken limbs. One guy with a broken arm, one guy with a broken leg, one guy with a broken collarbone, and they're all in the Notre Dame infirmary. And I said, well, uh, the uh, Golden Knights have crapped out on the telephone, or on the, on the airplane coming back on base of the tornadoes. Go to Chicago, put Al Raymond, who is the number two guy, make him in charge of the cadets going to Chicago, and then you stay with the guys in uh, South Bend until we see what their medical condition is. And I will make arrangements to have a uh, aircraft, medevac aircraft, come in there and pick them up, bring them back to West Point, when you tell me that it can be picked up. So Raymond goes, and, and uh, we run this all-night jitney service down into New York's three airports and get all these cadets back. So Al Raymond comes in about 4 o'clock in the morning and says, can I get a stay back for the cadets? So they don't have to meet the uh, 7.30 class. I said, hell no, you can't, you can't get a stay back. I mean, I, I'm, I'm already way exceeding my authority by uh, not having the cadets here at 6.30. I can't give you a stay back. So I said, cadets, I have to go to class. So first class, 7.30 in the morning. And about 8 o'clock, Dean shows up to see the commandant. Because the cadets are passing out in class. They're what? They're, they're passing out in class. So or they're passing out, they're out they're, cold. They're asleep Totally class. exhausted, yes. Yeah. So, uh, the commandant calls me up to his office and said, what the hell is going on here? I told him all this long story that I just said. He said, he said, well, we came out number two in the nation, right? He said, yeah. He said, well, you should have called me and I could have probably arranged with Dean to get the state back to where it is. He said, you know, it's not very good, you know, bringing them back at three or four o'clock in the morning. I said, well, I had to get them back in time. Class. I didn't think it's my authority to give an excuse to Dean. That's right. Why not your authority? They're sleeping in class. That's highly irregular, you know. You know, and, and the dean was a guy named Jenneron, and Jenneron later turns out to be a good friend of mine, but I mean, he, he gave me an ass in there, and the commandant gave me an ass about that. And there was a little tension between the commandant and the dean about all that, but the commandant was sticking up for me. So I look back on that, I mean, I'm a major, I'm, I'm in there, I got 40 cadets doing this, and I'm essentially I'm the Lone Ranger. You're the Lone Ranger. And, uh, but the commandant's sticking up for him. So Peter Field, we finally get the cadets back in. I get a medevac plane in there and pick up these three guys. Peter Field comes in and I says, hey, listen, you get your very best Bib and Tucker on as a British officer, and I want you to report to the superintendent and tell the superintendent how well these guys perform. Because I said, I'm taking a lot of flack on this thing. So he goes up and reports to the superintendent, and he gives a call. I say so, you know, he's Japanese, he's terrific jolly guy, good. He's a jolly good guy, a tremendous guy. He said, by the way, they were beaten by a group of people from Southern California. He said, they're lawyers and ex-graduates at UCLA and Southern California and all this kind of stuff. And he said, so they were beaten by a group of people five years older than they were, all professional people and all that kind of stuff. Well, the soup laid off. Break, break. Stream of letters begins to appear at West Point. Telegrams appear at West Point. Wonderful team. Tremendous group of young men. Served the nation's finest. Uh, it was a distinct honor and a privilege to meet them on a field of combat. This is from the guys who beat them. Yeah. It said, uh, we can understand why the American Army is populated by such high quality people at uh, Ray Wilkins. So I smell a rat now. So I go get Al Raymond, who's my army, he's my U.S. Army guy. I said, Al, what the what, what the hell went on between uh, between South Bend and Chicago? Oh, he said the uh, 
the Southern California team asked us if we'd like to ride our buses since we were going to get these planes out of there. So they had a couple of buses going to South Bend. He said three or four kegs of beer on each one of these buses. And of course, all the cadets got tanked up on the bus. So the, the point I'm making about that is that guy that didn't have any initiative, you know, would take the easy way out. You know, no, one, don't go to start with. Two, the weather's bad. Come, come home, home now and default. Yeah, you know, you know. I mean, so, but but I knew that you know one of the things. One of the things is to get inside the uh, the commander's head. Yes, the intent. Yeah. And the commander, in this case, Davison, was a benevolent, although authoritative, commander. He's also benevolent when it came to taking care of cadets, and he knew that this was important to the cadets. And so he would have wanted me to do that. I never never asked him about that because I was inside of his head. Right. At least I thought he was. Okay. Okay, break, break. Uh, Davison departs. Well, Davison, I go up to see Davison one day and I say, the cadets want to have uh, a, a bash in the uh, officer's club, or no, in the uh, cadet mess. And uh, they want to have a uh, buffet after the football games. It's a great idea. So I get with my mess hall guys and I say, look, I want to run a buffet over here for cadets and their dates and parents. Terrible place to eat up there. You couldn't go off post and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. So uh, this turned out to be a pretty good deal. And after the ball game, fed the plebes 20 minutes after the game. And then at uh, 5.30 in the afternoon, we had a buffet, open house buffet, bring dates in, bring mothers in, bring fathers in, pay a buck, have a great meal, get a chance to see the mess hall, and cadets felt good about that. So on a Monday morning, I'm walking across from my POQ, which is next to the, uh, the uh, West Point Army uh, mess up there, in officer's mess, and uh, I intersect the superintendent who's walking from his quarters over to his office. And I salute to General Lambert, and I said, good morning, General Lambert. He says, good morning, Max. I mean, he knows who I am because I'm running this big activity game, and I'm, I'm well known on the campus for running this thing. He said, uh, I need to ask you a question. Yes, sir. He said, uh, did I see women in the mess hall Saturday afternoon? I said, you certainly did, sir. I said, you know, every Saturday afternoon, we run a buffet after the football game. 20 minutes after the game, feed the plebes without dates. And then 5.30, we open it up for, uh, it's a buffet, and we open it up, we charge people. So we fed 1,800 people in there, charge them a buck thing, so made $1,800 for the mess on Saturday afternoon. Lampert was about my size, cold, white hair. And he looked at me and he said, Major, the next time you change the tradition <laughs> of the military, at the academy. military academy, would you kindly let me in on it? I said, all the way, sir. You know, yes, sir. So I went straight to my office and walked straight up to uh, Davison's office, and I said, if you don't get a buzzer in the next five minutes, you better get over and see the superintendent because he has taken umbrage at the uh, fact that we're feeding women, women in the mess hall. Mm. About that time, the buzzer <laughs> rang, and Davison walked over to the uh, over to the uh, superintendent's office, and everything was copacetic. I mean, after he saw me, but there was tension between Davison and uh, the uh, superintendent because Davison had been there when. Uh, Lambert uh, had arrived, and so Davison was king of the hill, and Lambert sort of was a little bit miffed about that. You know, the strength. Davison's a very strong-minded man, as evidenced by the fact he rises to be a four-star general. You don't get to be one unless you're fairly strong-minded and will and will take things under your toe. And but Davison hadn't even cleared that with him. 
and so the superintendent felt a little nonplussed that, that this tradition was being broken by this major. Obviously, Davison was endorsing what I was doing, and I cleared it with him, but this is one of those things where Davison clearly backed me up. So, I mean, that then gave me greater license to do more stuff. And so when Davison left, we got a much more milder-mannered uh, commandant, and uh, the superintendent stayed the same, and therefore the superintendent began to put the squeeze on the commandant a little bit. But nonetheless, I had a great deal of authority and operated with the same. And uh, cadets, I said to the cadets one day, I said, you know, uh, we're going to have a ring dance here and you pass out rings. Why don't we have uh, wine in the mess hall and the cadets, you know, will toast the colors and toast the military academy and all that. And the cadets said, wine in the mess hall? We never had wine in the mess hall. I said, you haven't? And well, the commandant said, we're going to have wine in the mess hall. It's going to be a dining in. A di it's going to be a dining out. That's what we're going to have and present the rings and we're going to have wine on the tables. I said, geez, I better go clear that with the superintendent. So he went clear that with the superintendent. So I brought that into that. I was on the uh, the board of governors of the uh, Westmore Army mess. It was losing money, officers mess, and uh, got cadets admitted as first classmen so they could take guests over the mess over to the uh, officers club and like suddenly made money. So he gave me the opportunity to be an adventuresome major. And I don't know whether I recounted that story with Ray Murphy, but the fencing team on the last go around, I would give I you read that, that one. one in the uh, in your other outbrief. Yeah, but but that that that's very exciting. Got me a job in as a com in battalion Vietnam. commander yeah. in Vietnam. Yeah. So you see, so you see now the reputation, or the not the reputation, but West Point, West Point. While I chafed at not getting back to troops. to troops and getting back to Vietnam because I didn't know how long the war was going, West Point turns out to give me the lever to overcome the fact that I hadn't been a battery commander because I impress a guy at West Point who counts later. I didn't know he would, but he, he understands it. And he knows that I'm going to be a good battalion commander. He don't give a damn what the record says about whether or not I've had four other jobs or not. He says, I want that guy to be a battalion commander because I know what that guy can do. He's seen me operate. And so looking back on that, uh, this running these 50 clubs and all of them going everywhere, hell's a breakfast and doing things all over America and trying to represent it and run these professors who are out directing these activities. Yeah, they were all volunteers. They were right? all doing volunteers. Their spare time. Trying to support them. Gave me a, uh, a, I mean, I look back now as in saying confidence builder in uh, at Fort Bliss, Texas, uh, off to an early stage of war, I mean, to, to Vietnam. war in Vietnam as a captain, uh, then back uh, at West Point and being given a substantial, on a, on a job nobody would apply for, but a job that as a major gave me enormous uh, exposure, visibility, exposure, visibility well authority, responsibility, authority, yeah. responsibility. Yeah. Uh, I look back at that, people say, what kind of job was that? And I say, well, I had, the, I had the number three job at West Point. The superintendent had number one job and the uh, number four job. The superintendent had number one job. The commandant had number two. The director of athletics had number three, and I had the number four job as a major at West Point. So, and learning staff procedures. I mean, you had to deal with the transportation facilities of America. I dealt with with people all over America and uh, trying to get these things arranged, laid on, and all that kind of stuff. So I look back on that now and seeing that was a formative piece of experience. The other thing it did, it solidified my opportunity to get a job in combat to command a battalion. And it could have turned out that if I hadn't built up those bona fides uh, that way, then, uh, you know, in a different way, I'd be the deputy senior advisor of the regional forces, popular forces. 
So it was a very, it was a very uh, salutary experience. Had the right guy work for Michael Davis. Been the wrong guy out there, or a different guy. He worked for well, the second guy. If I'd worked for the second guy first, it'd have been a different proposition because he was less interested. Yeah. Now, by the time I get to the second superintendent, who's a guy named Bennett, Bennett, Bennett finds out who I am. I don't know exactly how he would get my reputation, but uh, Bennett gives me two specific tasks to do, one sort of humorous. Uh, when he gives me the class of 1915 and tells me to go out and, and uh, satisfy their desire to give a gift to the military academy. And the second is he gives me the uh, Up With The People group. You recall back in the uh, 60s there was a group of young people sponsored by the Gillette Company called uh, Up With People, Up With America. It was a youthful organization. They sang. There was a big choir, not choir, but a big youth group that sang and had great music. And uh, is it sort of a national thing? Well, they traveled all over America and they wanted to come to West Point. They were actually a proselytization, proselyting organization. We didn't know that at the time. But it turns out that they were. But for religion or for yep. Or, and uh, but uh, Don Bennett is now the superintendent. Then I have my famous uh, fencing escapade with Don Bennett, and he backs me up. So, I mean, I'm getting backing from very senior people. So it makes me very comfortable right. to work as a uh, young officer with very senior people. I mean, I look at generals at that time, you know, one and three-star generals who are my immediate superiors, and I'm comfortable working with those guys. They seem to respect the kind of work I do, so it gives me an enormous comfort index that uh, many other people didn't have an opportunity. Yeah, you know, one of the things that, that uh, if you try to do a uh, lay down about strategic leadership or how you develop strategic leaders, and we haven't come to any of that yet, but one of the, one of the ways in which you develop leaders is you give them the opportunity to work with leaders who are already ensconced as leaders, either as their executive officer, their aides de camp, or their immediate assistants. And they get they get a chance to vicariously uh, observe and participate in high level decision making. And and they take on information about that, which gives them the uh, capability to operate at that level that other people don't have. They learn what the process is. They learn, they learn the considerations, the process, the thought opportunities about that, and it, it substantially broadens a person uh, to be able to have an opportunity to do that. I had such a job like that as a major. I mean, it's, it's a dog robbing job. I mean, nobody would solicit it. But it turns out that the job was a very broadening opportunity for a sort of narrow gauged guy at that particular time. You made it so. I wonder if all the activities, staff officers, I made think, it up I then. think that uh, I don't know how you get that. Yeah. You'd have to sort of do a. You follow me? In other words, I, I don't know. Uh, it's sort of outrageous for a captain to call up his assignment officer and say, move me out today. Right. Sort of, outrageous, sort of outrageous for you to go to the uh, vice chief of staff of the Army and say, I don't want to be in the Ordnance Corps. That's what I meant when I said, I don't know how you got away with it. No, me either. But I think it's wonderful that you did. No, I don't know either. I'm not sure I get away with it. Uh, I think Partly it's the confidence, I think, that you said, that even if you're wrong, search your position with force and authority. Yeah. I worked as a kid in high school. I worked 120 hours a day. I got paid twice a, uh, twice a month, every two weeks. I worked 120 hours a day. 60 hours a week? Mm -hmm. That's in high school. Mm -hmm. That's in the dairy company? Yeah. 
And I think there's something about working and running something. And I ran something as a 16-year-old year kid, 18-year-old kid. I ran something. I think that's a, I think it's, it gives you a certain amount of confidence uh, that you can do that. Now, whether you can go out and be an entrepreneur uh, and set up your own business, I think that's a different level. But, it, you know, inside of a structure, which that company, I mean, this dairy manufacturing operation was a, was a structured environment, and inside of that I thrived and earned respect, ran a team of people even as a high schooler and all through college, and so working wasn't hard for me. So then when you put me in a structured environment like the military, although I'm not, I'm not wise about everything in the military, Carrying out the functions inside the military seemed to me to be pretty easy to do. You follow me? And so, uh, if you told me to go out and set up a business outside, I, I might be more difficult for me to do it. But inside this 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 overarching structure of uh, carrying out responsibilities, exerting initiative seems to me to be perfectly plausible to go do that. Why some do and why some don't, I don't know. Now, this is one of the things does seem to be special about you uh, is that you're willing to uh, use what's coming out of the inside of your head, sort of integrate it with what's going on in the environment and come up with a new solution that makes eminently good sense, such as sending the uh, rugby team to the Nationals. I don't know that I was a very smart integrator at those days. I, I think, in my own view, I look at uh, the association with Depew, uh, later as lieutenant colonel, as the time in which I began to excel at integration synthesis. And I think that's a long suit.